Um, I'm going to talk about uh, another analysis pipeline, um, CHAMP. It's a chip analysis methylation pipeline. Um, and so you've already heard about a couple other um, pipelines that are available for the 450K array, um, particularly watermelon that Chloe just spoke about and also RN beads um, that Christoph Bach mentioned. Um, additionally, you'll hear about MinFi later on in the day, and then the original, uh, the first um, published uh, pipeline was IMA. Um, also, uh, there's f four normalizations that have been published, and I think um, most of them were mentioned this morning. So, uh, there's a PBC peak-based peak correction method, um, also um, a subset quantile normalization method, the SWAN method, and um, the most recently published beta mixture quantile normalization method um, called BMIQ. And so uh, I'll present a um, pipeline that we've developed, um, and it incorporates all four normalization methods. And uh, my talk will focus on the four aspects of the pipeline that um, make it unique to the other pipelines that are available. Um, and just to go through uh, the pipeline, it starts with the uh, IDAP files or the raw data files. Um, it loads them and provides QC images. It then um, calculates a methylation value. So you've heard about the beta value. You also have the option of using an um, M value, which um, has been shown to maybe be use more useful in smaller studies. Um, you can filter these for the detection P value for those um, probes that weren't detected. And then, as I said, th there's the four normalization methods that adjust for the type 2 bias. And then the pipeline offers a batch effects analysis called SVD that I'll talk about. Um, and then an option for a batch effects correction. Um, it uh, calls um, the most variable probes or the most variable positions, of the so single probes that are differentially methylated. And then you can flag these uh, for polymorphisms based on the thousands genome um, data. And then also uh, I'll present a novel method, method for um, DMR finding. And in addition, um, the pipeline includes a method for copy number analysis. Um, so I'll start by talking about the SVD batch, batch effects analysis method. And this was originally published by Andrew Teschendorf for the 27K. So um, it takes uh, the methylation values, so the beta or M values, um, any study specific um, phenotype information that you have about your study, age, or uh, anything, date it was um, ran, anything. And then also the control probe values that you get from Genome Studio. Um, and this results in a heat map uh, that looks something like this. So um, these are the internal <coughs> controls that come from mm, Genome Studio. And then uh, these are, uh, for instance, the um, location on the, the chip is the Centrix position, the Centrix ID. And then um, you might have a few uh, variables that recommend represent biological variation, and then you might have other variables like sample plate. Um, and so as you can see here, the darker colors shows um, the lower p-value. So in this um, study, the most of the variation was seen in the biological um, variable, which is what you'd hope for. Um, so is this method, singular variable, va singular value decomposition, identifies the significant components of variation, and so this helps to identify confounding variation, um, and this helps to improve the identification of differential methylation that you're actually interested in that's related to the biological variables. Um, and just as an example, this is from the paper with the 27K. This was um, an example of um, the heat map before normalization where you can see, um, can't see so well, but these represent technical variables up here, and you can see th the darker colors showed that there was significant um, batch effects for technical variables here, and they didn't disappear with quantile normalization, but having done the SVD, you can see that they're there, and you can make other um, changes in your data set, potentially removing confounding samples um, to, to improve uh, the heat map. Um, so options for correcting for batch effects include the removal of confounding samples or also uh, there is a combat batch effects correction that's included in the pipeline. And it won't do anything magical if, if you have confounded samples, but it does correct for some batch effects. Um, so then moving on to um, another uh, aspect of the pipeline is um, our method for a differential methylation 
the calling of DMRs or differentially methylated regions. Um, and so this uh, takes as input um, the list that you would get from an R library called Lima, which um, we have in the pipeline that calculates uh, or that calls the um, probes that have been differentially methylated. So it takes the p-values from this list and uses that to calculate DMRs. Um, this method is uh, the work of Lee Butcher in um, my group, and um, so I'll kind of go through the details of the method. It is, uh, uses a window to find the DMRs, and this window is feature-oriented and dynamic, so it depends on the features that the actual probes are located in. So um, first off, it calculates the probe spacing for um, each probe depending on the feature that it's located in. And so the probe spacing is study dependent because you might have filtered out several probes in the pre-processing steps. You might have filtered out failed probes, uh, sex chromosomes, and also um, probes with potential polymorphisms from the thousands genomes data. Um, so this is image shows um, the number of probes in each of these features. So I'm sure it's difficult to see, but at the bottom you have the different um, bins for each feature, including first exon, three prime UTR, five prime UTR, body, um, the intergenomic region, and then the transcription start site. Um, and then this is further divided into islands, none, shelf, or shore. So as you can see, most of the probes fall in um, the three prime UTR, none, the five prime UTR, the IGR, none, and, or I'm sorry, the, the largest spaces between probes fall in these regions. So, so the probes that are most densely spaced are in the transcription start site and the first exon, and also in the islands of each of the other regions. Um, so based on this, which would be specific to your data set, because you, you might have filtered out some probes, uh, you then calculate the radius of the lasso that you want to use for each of these different groups of features. So you take the um, feature that is least densely spaced, so in this case it's the three prime UTR shore, and um, you chose, uh, we chose a lasso of 1 KB for this, and then that represents a particular quantile, and this quantile is then used for the lasso for each of the other features. So, and this, some of these uh, parameters, for instance, 1KB, um, can be um, adjusted if, if you'd rather use something else. So then to explain exactly how this works, this focuses in on one region of the genome, um, on chromosome 3, and shows these are the significant probes in that region, and this is the features that they fall within. So based on that, you have, as I was mentioning, a separate size lasso for each of these feature regions. And so um, if you apply these, you center the lasso in the significant probe, and if the lasso, oh, if the lasso um, covers three probes, then it's considered a DMR. Um, so here you'd see this only covers one, so it's not considered a DMR. And then here in the body, the lasso is larger, but it still needs to catch three probes to be a DMR. Um, additionally, if there is less than a thousand base pairs between what you might call a mini DMR, then that is called one big DMR. So, um, and this number, a thousand base pairs, can also be adjusted. Um, so that's a probe lasso method. And um, in addition, I mentioned that you can um, flag based on the uh, thousands genomes uh, data. So I'll mention that in a more detail. So we've um, annotated, also done by Lee Butcher in my group, we've annotated the thousands genomes data for each probe on the 450K. And this is useful because um, SNPs can occur within a probe or at a target, dinu target dinucleotide, and this might mean that actually the change you're seeing is genetic rather than epigenetic. So um, the data includes four populations, European, <laughs> American, Asian, and African, and you can flag or filter SNPs based on whether they fall at the um, probed C within 10 base pairs of the three prime end or if there's any overlap in the probe. Um, and the final 
module in the um, pipeline that I wanted to discuss is the copy number analysis module. And so this takes as input the intensity values and uses the R package DNA copy to um, produce DNA copy profiles for each chromosome. And this um, is work done by Andy Fieber in my group, and the paper is currently under review um, in genome biology. Uh, so as I said, you, it takes the um, intensity values and it produces an image and also a, um, a text file. Um, and this, um, well, I'll mention the, te the text file then includes for each probe, which um, if it's in a copy number um, addition or deletion, and exactly how big that deletion is and where you can find it. And so this uh, has been um, validated using um, SNP6 data. So this is um, an image produced from the CNA um, module in the CHAMP pipeline. And this uh, deletion here has been highlighted using SNP6 data. And you can see that the, the deletion was also found in SNP6. So um, we've, and we find that uh, the big deletions and additions are va validated with um, SNP6, and it shows that um, this uses the same samples that you've used in um, your 450K, so you avoid any problems with tissue heterogeneity. And also, you could say that the 450K might be focused more on the um, parts of the genome that you might be interested in, so um, it filters out some of the information that might not be useful that you'd have to filter through in the SNP data. Um, so the pipeline offers all of these steps, and you can do them individually, or there's um, a function where you can just kind of click it and everything will be run together. Um, so just to summarize, um, it's a, a package that's been written in R. It incorporates several published um, normalization methods for intra-array normalization, also the option to use a batch effects correction, and it offers new functionality using SVD for batch effects analysis, SNP filtering from a thousands genomes, annotated SNP data, a DMR finder, probe lasso, and CNA analysis. And the co uh, it's available for download here. And um, this is just being released publicly, so I expect um, there will still be a lot of bugs, but um, I welcome your feedback and any ideas you have for improving it. And I'd like to thank those that contributed, in particular Lee Butcher and Andy Fieber, and also Andrew Teschendorf. And thank you. Do you have any questions? Just a quick question about the copy number variant analysis. I didn't yeah. quite understand how how it works okay. because if you have a part of the C of the genome that is duplicated or deleted, um, how would that change your methylation? If it's deleted, you would just get detection p values that are very high, and you'd immediately see it's not there. Uh, if it's duplicated, why would you expect the methylation values? The, I mean, I see why you, the intensity values would change, but why would? Or how 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 does it work? Basically? Well, it's using the intensity values, <laughs> so you'd expect um, if there is more copies, then the intensity values would be higher, and so it's it's using that as a calculation of the copy number. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my question also relates to copy number analysis, and um, I, I found using Evo Queen's method that he published on the 27 KOA not to work with um, DNA that's been extracted from formula and fixed higher from embedded tissue. Um, I just wondered if you'd had a chance to investigate whether your technique works on the FFP DNA. Um, I don't know specifically, but I know we do have a lot of FFP data in the lab, so I imagine that it's been compared, but I can't answer for sure. And have you compared your method to the one published by uh, Stephen Fisser on the Glion data set? No, I haven't. So. Okay. No. <laughs> Any more questions?
you know the details of the SNP filtering yeah. option that's allowed? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, as far as using, so we use DB SNP instead okay. of 1,000 genomes yeah. when we've decided where SNPs are. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I'm not familiar with the 1,000 genomes. Mm -hmm. So do you require a minor allele frequency minimum? Yeah, so um, the that? default is 1% minor allele frequency, but it can be adjusted because um, in the annotation file that comes with the package, it's, um, it's calculated for each one, so you can choose whatever cutoff you'd like. Yeah. And then um, when you say within 10 base pairs of the three prime end, you're talking about within the probe body, though. Yes, yes. Not outside. Right, the body. exactly. So you can just choose if you're only interested. The, the default is just interested in pr probes that, um, or uh, SNPs that occur at the, the probe CPG, but you can choose it anywhere in the probe body. Any more questions? I will differentiate, I will be a little bit clear here. I think that there are two cases. You can either have a, a nearby SNP controlling the methylation status of the CBG, and that's biologically interesting. Yeah. Or you could have a SNP uh, near a methylation site that impacts your ability to measure methylation correctly right. at the methylation site, which is an artifact or yeah. a, a yeah. problem with the assay. And I would say that most of the SNPs you are removing here, or the way you are filtering here, is actually for the second case. I, and I would say there's a lot of interest in finding places where SNPs control or genotype control your, your F genotype. Yeah. But I mean, that, I mean yeah. that's just like small. Well, that's why I, I state it as being flagging or filtering, because you may not want to filter them all out, because <coughs> they might not be um, contributing. <coughs> 